Welcome to First Baptist Church of Gaston. We are so glad that you are with us. We have many events coming soon that you don't want to miss. Here's what's coming up in the next few weeks. Brotherhood will be meeting Tuesday, January 30th at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. There will be a message and a meal will be served. Please make sure that you plan on attending. See Chris Vadreen if you have any questions. Our Grief Share group will be meeting on Sunday, February 4th at 3 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you have joined or would like to join this group, feel free to contact Paul Abrams with any questions. Spiritual Warriors will be Wednesday, February 7th at 11.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This is an event for all of our senior adults. Make sure that you plan on attending and bring a side dish to share. Please make sure you sign up today after the service for a time to take a picture for our directory. These pictures will be taken February 23rd through the 25th. You have to be a church member in order to take these pictures. Our 2024 preaching plans will be available for pickup today in the Welcome Center. Make sure that you plan on grabbing a copy. Motivational Mondays will be starting back. This is a weekly gathering and will take place every Monday. Bill Guy will be facilitating this study of God's Word. We are excited about our upcoming Valentine's Banquet on Friday night, February 9th at 6 o'clock p.m. It will be catered by Park Lane Seafood. The cost per person will be $20 and there will be child care. The deadline to sign up is Sunday, February 4th. And the envelopes are in the Welcome Center and the drop box is right there too. Remember, you don't have to have a sweetheart to be a sweetheart. Tonight, January 28th at 6 o'clock here at First Baptist Church of Gaston, Pastor Chris Terry will be ordained. Please make plans on attending this special night for Pastor Chris. The men's prayer group will be meeting every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in the room across from the library. All men are encouraged to attend to pray for our church services. Please contact Charles Burton if you have any questions. Our bicentennial cookbook is coming soon. Please grab a recipe sheet from the Welcome Center to submit a recipe or submit a recipe in honor of someone. These are due by March 3rd in the flat boxes in the Welcome Center. Thank you for joining us today. We can't wait to see you at these events coming up. We are First Baptist Church of Gaston, the caring place that gathers, grows, and goes, all for the glory of God. Well, hello, my name is Pastor Brady, and you have found, successfully found, our online streaming right here on our Facebook page. Or maybe you're watching on our website. No matter where you're watching from, we want to thank you for tuning in for today's live worship service from right here at the Caring Place that gathers, grows, and goes all for the glory of God. We hope and pray you enjoy your worship experience today. So let us know in the comment section below if you're on Facebook that you're here. Hit that share button and grab your Bible and get ready to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, during this worship service today. Thank you, and we're glad you're here. For that cookbook picture, y'all get a kick out of that. Those were my cookbooks. I don't use them, but I had them. <laughs> you may be here today, and you may be hurting. You may be in a point that you're thrilled to be here. You might not even understand how you feel today. So today we pray that you see Jesus and that you're touched by Jesus before you leave this place. Every dark addiction 
ancient stars to bring, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. As I speak, Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your Good morning. morning. That was great. You guys are getting so good. I'm so so proud of you. It's a beautiful day out this morning, isn't it? Amen. Did you hear that response? (laughs) It's a beautiful day out this morning, isn't it? Yes, it's beautiful. That's good. It's good to be in God's house this morning. I'm so glad to be here. God is so good, and we're anxious to hear God's word this morning. And I just praise God that I'm able to be here this morning. And I just pray that we'd all stand up right now. And we're going to do our scripture verse this morning. I just want to uh, 
extend a welcome for those that are visiting for the first time. We have a contact card in the pew right in front of you. So if you'd like to fill that out, we have boxes at the back of the vestibule. You could drop that off. We'd like to get a record of your visit today. Our scripture verse today is 1 John 4, 16. Everybody repeat with me. We know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. Please remain, no, nope. we're gonna be seated. seated. They're gonna be seated this time, okay, thank you. So today our moment in history is about Vacation Bible School, which I absolutely love. Every year is probably one of my favorite weeks of the year. And uh, a lot of people look forward to vacation, and I do too, but I really look forward to Vacation Bible School. Uh, we, I have a picture that I had, and it is from 1968. And I was three years old at that point. But you know what makes my heart happy? is that I'm in the picture. And I had a mom that loved me enough that made sure I was at vacation Bible school every year. Um, how many of y'all in the room remember the VBS parades that we did? Do y'all remember those? So literally, if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, okay? So we would meet here at the church and we would make these posters and we'd tape them on the side of our cars and stuff like that. And we'd roll the windows down and we'd ride all through Gaston saying, come to vacation Bible school. That's all we did. That was the parade. That was it. <laughs> but we had the best time. We went all through the neighborhoods and that's how people found out we would do it like on a Saturday so that they would know starting on Monday we had VBS, and we had it then during the day. We had it um, like 9 to 12, and, we, and, our, and our snacks, Colette and her group had done a tremendous job because our snacks were red punch and cookies, right? That was what we had, and they were the best cookies and red punch you ever had because they were just during VBS. But what I'd like to see is I, I, I looked up some statistics. There's, a, there's some things back and forth about who really started VBS, some people say it started in Iowa. Some people say it started in New York, and then it came down south. Um, but really, it was very interesting, I thought. The first mention of Vacation Bible School was the year 1894. So I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. I'm not much of a stats person like I wish I was, so I thought I'd talk from my heart. And this is what I want to tell you about the history of Vacation Bible School. I am your worship leader today because of Vacation Bible School, because that's where I met Jesus. I had teachers that cared enough to come every day that week, and I had Sunday school teachers and discipleship training teachers and GA leaders that poured their heart into me. But that opportunity at VBS was where it wasn't in front of the whole church the first time, and sometimes kids don't have that courage. So that opportunity at VBS, I got to walk down the aisle, and hold uh, Dr. Uh, Cap's hand and pray with, he prayed with me. And I accepted Jesus Christ. My mom wasn't in the room. So on the way home, I remember saying, guess what, mom? She was like, what? I said, I asked Jesus in my heart today. And she just cried. I said, why are you crying? <laughs> I didn't know why she was crying. I was happy. But I know now it was happy tears. <laughs> we have a mission field right outside these doors. And we are blessed one time a year to bring all those children in. And this year is June 23rd through the 26th. You can change a life. You can absolutely change a life. If you happen to be a person who was saved during Vacation Bible School, would you please stand up? If you were saved during Vacation Bible School, look around you, look around you at these people. Now, keep standing. If you've ever attended Vacation Bible School, please stand up. Vacation Bible School changes lives. The history that we have, keep standing because you're fixing to sing. The history that we have can continue to future generations. It can be our history, our present, 
and our future. So find a place to serve this year, whether it's in prayer, in being in the adult class, teaching, recreation, serving food, find a way to be involved in Vacation Bible School. Love divine is what makes us different from the world. standing for prayer. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning and we thank you so much for, first of all, waking us up this morning. Thank you for breath in our lungs, Father, and, and giving us this opportunity to come into your house and worship this morning. Father, we just pray for Pastor Brady today as he brings the word. We just pray you hide him behind the cross and that you would be seen high and lifted up. And Father, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word today, Father, but we would be doers. Father, we just pray for the tithes and offerings, Father, today, that they would be used for the uplifting of your kingdom. And Father, we thank you for what you're going to do now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Your promise still stands, it's chasing after me.
Thank you so much, Michelle, for that. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn this morning to the book of Titus. And if you're visiting with us today, my name's Pastor Brady, and I serve as pastor here. Love serving here and love God's Word, as many of you do. And I invite you to turn in or turn on to Titus. We're currently going through a series that we've called Committed to the Bride. And each week we're looking at different things that the Apostle Paul wanted Titus to be committed to in regards to the local church. And so uh, we're going to look at Titus chapter 1 verses 10 through 16 in just a moment. If you weren't here with us last week, I want to remind you that last Sunday uh, we looked at the qualifications of a pastor uh, from Titus chapter 1 verses uh, 6 or actually all the way verse 5 uh, through 9 last week as we looked at how a pastor should be properly properly dedicated to his family, purposefully distant from the flesh, positively demonstrate fruit and provide doctrine that is found in the Bible. Now this morning I want to talk to you uh, on a sermon I've entitled Committed to Confrontation. Committed to Confrontation. And I want to give you the sermon in a sentence this morning. In the local church, we need to commit to confrontation in a loving way when we are made aware of defiance, deception, deterioration, defilement, and disobedience in the flock of God. Now, let me give you a somewhat funny illustration to begin this morning. Because so far in Titus, everything's been pretty positive, right? He's opened up with a greeting about how uh, Paul, how he is a servant. Last week, he talked about how uh, there are qualifications in order to be a pastor. He's kind of hit some of those. But this morning, he alludes to the fact that there are false teachers on the island of Crete, and there are false teachers everywhere. When the gospel is preached, there are those that will oppose it, right? That's just a fact of life. Now, a few years ago, when Hannah and I were serving in our first church, our first ministry job, I was a, a ministry intern at a church. I was um, elevated to minister of connections or whatever, which just means I did marketing for them. And so while we were there, uh, the pastor, I, the pastor didn't know this, but God was calling us to uh, Williamston, which is in Anderson County, to serve as the youth minister there and later associate pastor. So he didn't know this, but I was getting close to letting him know that I would be leaving the church. And uh, he preached that Sunday in, uh, it was November, wasn't it? Yeah, it was November 18th of 2019. And he preached uh, on a message called The Call of Confrontation. Now, he did not preach on false teaching like I will this morning, but he talked about how if you have something to say, just say it. Right? And, and talking about confronting different things. So I thought about it. I slept on it. So the next morning I said, well, I'm just going to tell him, right? So I told him. I asked him to meet. He wasn't able to do that. Uh, so I had to do it over the phone. And he said, what? Well, where's this coming from? I said, well, you, you said we needed to confront. <laughs> right? I mean, that, so for my staff members today, Chris and Sherelle, please don't do that to me. <laughs> don't do that to me today. I, I don't, I don't want to lose you. But like I said, so far everything in Titus has been very positive. Now these verses this morning that we're going to see are going to reveal that false teachers needed to be confronted and they needed to be silenced. So this message is not talking about confronting somebody you have beef with. That's, that's not what this is about. In the local church, we have to be committed to confronting false doctrine. That's what we have to be committed to. And we need to constantly remember that. As I told my new members class this morning, this is not a sermon that you're going to look back, uh, look back on and say, man, that was one of the best steak meals I've ever had. This is probably going to be one of those sandwiches that kept you alive spiritually. Maybe not one of those sandwiches that tasted good. But whenever you're confronted with false teachers in the local church one day, I hope and pray you'll look back on this message and say, this is how we find out whether or not there are false teachers in our midst. This is how we find out to protect our own church and our beliefs. Robert Yarborough said this about this passage. Uh, and actually, specifically, what was going on in Crete at this time. He said, negative local developments or conditions in the form of troublesome 
people. Ever since the gospel was presented, there have been those who oppose it. Now, the Bible speaks against false teaching a lot. All throughout the Bible, it's confronted. In the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament alone, let me, if you're taking notes, I'll, I'll tell you these quickly. Let me give you some passages to look at later on where false teaching is confronted. Jesus confronts false teaching in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 where he said, Beware false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Paul said this in Acts 20, verses 29 through 30, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves who will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. We're reminded in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, that Peter says this, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Let me remind you of what John said in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. While reconciliation is a big part of the ministry of a pastor, so is rebuking. While confronting is a big part of the ministry of a pastor, so is confronting. And I think that Paul is trying to tell Titus that pastors, church leaders, deacons, and I would even go out on a limb and say church members have the responsibility to protect the the sheep against false doctrine. Now, you might not believe it, but there are false teachers running rampant. And to tell you the truth, all you have to do is go on Facebook or YouTube, and you can find a lot of them very quickly. And some of you have asked me before, maybe you've shared a video about a preacher that you like, and you asked me about them, and I will tell you. There are many well-known preachers that will tickle your ear fancy that are teaching false doctrine. And it's important that you know that. If you have a question about a particular person, you should be able to identify them on your own. You can always ask me, but if you're a Christian, you should be able to identify what false teaching is and what false teaching is not. One reason the church in America today is at such a decline is because we don't know the doctrine that we do believe. So how can we identify false teaching if we don't know what true teaching is? So in this passage we're going to read, there's five different things that Paul mentions uh, that need to be confronted in the local church if false teachers are existent. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to stand, if you're physically able, in the honor of the reading of the Word of God from Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. Now, in verse 10, I want you to look at that first word, for there. That comes from the Greek word, gar. And that word literally is a transition from talking about pastors to talking about what pastors need to do in confronting. The passage today and the passage last week are both connected by that Greek word gar. It's connected together. Verse 10, let's read it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. The circumcision party is a reference to Judaizers, and we've defined that before, but those who mix grace and law, and we'll talk about that. Verse 11, they must be silenced. That is an imperative that Paul gives in the Greek, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain that they ought not to cheat, teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Verse 13, this testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both, their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good 
work. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity to open up your word. Lord, we ask, Father, this morning that we'll be committed to confrontation in the local church and beyond when it comes to false teaching, Father. That in order to confront false teaching, we'll know what you teach us in your word. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, you may be seated. The question that I want to ask you this morning is what specific issues does the Apostle Paul tell Titus that he needs to confront and correct in the local churches at Crete, on the island of Crete? 140 miles of dimension, right? 140 miles wide. Number one, uh, Titus needs to correct their defiance. Look at verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. Those who go against the gospel of Christ are defiant. Those who uh, purposefully go against God, even those who don't mean to, those who are sinners and have not been saved are defiant. Even Christians who still sin are defiant against God. But false teachers specifically will be defiant and not repentant. That's the difference between a Christian and a false teacher, is that a false teacher is not going to repent about their defiance. A Christian will and should, right? There's three things you need to look at about their defiance. Number one, you need to look at their number. Look at verse 10. For they are many. There are many. The word, and like I said, that word gar connects here because the previous passage shows us the proper qualifications, but we also see the consequences when pastors, teachers, and leaders don't meet those qualifications. When a pastor doesn't meet the qualifications of, I say, let me rephrase that. When a man does not meet the qualifications from the Bible of a pastor, he's much more likely to be a false teacher. Because he's much more likely to come up with his own instead of what God has already said. So the task that Titus has all the way back to verse uh, 4 from last week or verse 5 from last week, we remember that Titus has a task of appointing elders, appointing pastors because of the false teachers that were present. Now that word many comes from the Greek word poly, P-O-L-L-I, poly. And in the Greek text, it is attached with an article. And that article carries a disproving and derogatory sense to the word. So in the Greek text, it literally means, for there are many, like with a dun dun dun, that kind of thing. It's a derogatory, it's a disproving, it is a discriminatory term in the Greek because there were numerous false teachers on the island of Crete. And let me give you a newsflash, just like there's many false teachers in the world today. Now, here's what I'm going to try to do this morning. I'm going to do my absolute best to not name any names of preachers that I think are false teachers because I'm not throwing arrows at anybody. But what I am telling you is you need to be careful as a Christian who you listen to. And if you've heard me preach for any length of time, I give you the outline. I send you my sermon notes via email. I do all this so you can check me all you want because I don't mind you checking me. But if you ever have a, peach, a teacher that doesn't want that, preacher, excuse me, you need to be careful. Dr. Daniel Aiken said there were many, not a few, false teachers at Crete who had apparently risen to some degree of prominence in the churches. Paul wouldn't have been talking about this if it wasn't an issue, right? Paul's not going to waste his time. You see their number. Secondly, look at their nature. Look at verse 10. Who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. Here the Apostle Paul gives us three characteristics of the defiant nature of false teachers. Number one, he says they're rebellious. The ESV translates the Greek word for that as insubordinate, but some of your translations say rebellious. Either way, it literally means not to be subjected, disorderly, and lawless. If anybody, not just false teachers, if anybody rejects accountability, that's a red flag. Whether it's in your job, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's with your children, if you are defiant against accountability, there's a problem. If you're defiant and you have the attitude of nobody can tell me anything, y'all, I've heard that in the church before. There's no place for that. Right? We're here to help each other. Now, obviously, the pastor is the spiritual leader of the church. You've got to trust them on some things that we might not have the liberty to tell you from time to time. But it's important that we remember that Paul is counting out or is counting on these false teachers being rebellious. Secondly, he calls them empty talkers. Dr. Daniel Aiken makes a really good point here. He says, these men were a law unto themselves. 
claiming a direct pipeline to God, they are not and would not be held accountable to anyone, a tell-tall sign of false teachers. Sometimes uh, we can refer to false teachers as what I call cotton candy preachers. Cotton candy preachers are preachers that look good. There's a lot of show in them, and it's sweet. Oh, it's sweet. But there's no substance. There's no substance in their preaching. Let me tell you something. If you spend an hour on sermon prep, it's going to be really hard to have substance in it. Right? That's why Acts chapter 6 is there. You can look at that on your own. The other thing he says is deceivers. This word can be translated also to seducer. False teachers are seducing them and seducing their listeners. You see their number of their defiance, the nature of their defiance. Look at their niche. Look at what Paul says here. Especially those of the circumcision party. Paul is calling out names. Now here's what I think is so interesting about Paul. I was thinking about this week in the shower. This in the shower. I do take long showers, and this is why. I was thinking about this, and here's what I was thinking. If Paul were a pastor today, very few churches would take his resume. Paul would come into the interview with the search committee, and Paul would tell them point blank, we don't want this guy to come in and tell us what to do. That's the role of a pastor. Just point blank, to lead the church. But most sheep don't want to be led, right? And so Paul would call out things that would inevitably get him fired. And so he calls here the circumcision party. Now, this term is to identify former Jews who joined the church in what we call uh, a gospel plus message. Now, this is not the only time that Paul uses the phrase circumcision party. He uses it in Acts 10.45, Acts 11.2, Galatians 2, 7 through 9, and and Galatians (coughs) 2.12. Their message was that you are saved by faith in the work of Christ plus religious knowledge, diets, rites, and practices. They added to the gospel. The best way to define them is Judaizers. They mix grace. They mix law. What does the end of Revelation say? Do not add to, do not take away from this book, right? And so not supposed to do that. Brian Chappell said this unsound message has nothing to it. Rather, it exalts matters that are worthless to God and deceives people into thinking that their heavenly status is determined by human accomplishments. You cannot be saved by what you do. You're only saved by who you know, being Jesus, right? So we see that false teachers are defiant. Secondly, look at verse 11 with me. False teachers are deceptive. There is deception in them, right? Look at verse 11. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. False teachers are going to be smooth, seducing, and they will know how to use their words. Let me tell you, they will be the epitome, no offense to anybody that sells cars, but they'll be the epitome of what a car salesman might try to do to you. And no offense to anybody, because there's some good ones out there, just like there's good preachers out there. But there's bad ones too, right? Whether that be power, control, influence, popularity, or money, they will teach whatever is necessary for their own shameful gain. The Apostle Paul is clear here. The role of elders that Titus is going to place on the island of Crete, their job is to silence false teachers and remove them. We don't have any that I'm aware of right now, but if we were to ever have a Sunday school teacher or anybody of that nature that was teaching and they're teaching a false doctrine, it's my job, the staff's job, and the deacon's job to remove them. To literally take out their voice and influence away from the families that are seeking to serve the Lord and are bombarded by false teaching. Paul is not on the defensive side of the ball. I think he's playing offense here. Confrontation is playing offense. Defense is where you're just waiting for it to come to you. Offense is where you go ahead and you nip it in the bud. Let me show you two things, I think, when it comes to the deception of these false teachers. Number one, their methods. Look at verse 11. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole 
families. I think what's interesting about this is that Paul does not, he's not talking about families as in the church. He's not talking about the synagogue. He's not talking about where they worship. He says whole families. And, and the connotation that this verse kind of gives is that he's talking about how false teachers were going into homes and upsetting families. In other words, they're going to church during the week and this false teacher would come on Tuesday night and say, you really believe what, what Pastor Titus just told you? You really believe that's true, right? And, and insert some false doctrine in there. So their methods were not loud and flamboyant. They were not in front of the pulpit. And most of the time, false teachers are not going to be behind the pulpit. Most of the time, they're going to be in your ear. They're going to sneak in. They're going to be smart. Because, for example, if a false teacher were to get up in front of however many people are here, odds are, hopefully, Lord willing, many of you would be able to call them out. Right? Right? Hopefully, we know our Bibles well enough. But if the false teacher goes into a small group, they're much more likely to be able to put the cloth over their eyes, so to speak. So their methods are extremely scary. But secondly, their motives. Look at verse 11. By teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. The motive for false teachers is not that they want to grow God's kingdom. It's that they want to financially grow their own kingdom. I think it's important for believers to stay away from what we call prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says if you give me $100, God's going to give you $10,000. I've never said that, and I never will say that. You should give to God simply because God says give. That's why you should give. You shouldn't give because you want something back. You should give simply because he commands us to as believers. Now, let me go ahead and tell you something. Preaching the word is not going to bring you popularity. Ask me and my wife. Now, a lot of y'all love us, but there's people that don't love us because we do tell the truth. And I think it's important to know that if you are going to be a preacher, like we're going to ordain one tonight, as long as you preach the word, you're going to have enemies. You know how they have those TV shows and, and stuff will happen in the movies or whatever, and they'll say, all right, do, do you have any enemies that might cause this to happen to you? And they go thinking through their mind, and I've already, if I ever get in a situation like that, I'm going to say, oh, yeah. I got a bunch. And half of them, I don't even know their names because they're keyboard warriors. Anyway, I got to get off that. But preaching the word is not going to bring you popularity. That's why many false teachers have large followings because they preach what people want to hear instead of what they need to hear. And that's very important to remember. Motives in ministry matter. Your motives in ministry matter a whole lot. And you need to check them before they wreck you. So far, we've seen defiance. We've seen deception. Look at verses 12 through 14. We see deterioration. The society of Crete had deteriorated over time. Verse 12 reveals that their very own philosopher said of them that they were liars, evil, lazy, and gluttons. So why does Paul mention this? To show that false teachers coming from Crete were also selfish people. People were coming out of the woodwork in Crete for their own selfish gain. Remember what I told you last week? That Crete was a resort island. It was a resort destination in that part of the world. It was a vacation spot. You know, when you go to uh, all these different vacations, when Hannah and I went on our honeymoon, we went to Jamaica. Some of y'all remember that. And um, a lot of people talked to me, even in the church, and I don't blame them, and said, don't you dare go off that resort. I'm like, why y'all think I would do that? Well, I got there. I wanted to go out. But everybody there kept saying, don't you do that, right? Because a lot of the time, even in Myrtle Beach or wherever, when you go to resort destinations, you got to be careful because there are people there that know you're vacationing. They know you brought money with you, and you can fill in the blank there. Now, what's interesting here is there's two things to talk about when it comes to their deterioration. One thing shows their deterioration in the fact that there was a reliable source that tells us that the Cretans were deteriorating spiritually. Look at verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. What's so cool about verse 12 is that verse 12 is an example of what we call parenthetical citation. So what ha- what's happening here is Paul is quoting a philosopher that was from Crete. 
and it was a philosopher who lived in the 6th century B.C. and was actually from Crete. His name was Epimedes, and Epimedes said this about his own people. You can look him up. He's a philosopher. He's kind of a crazy guy, but here's what he said about his own people where he came from. He said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. I believe that Paul is applying this quote in regards to false teachers. In other words, he's telling Titus, I'm not the only one that thinks these people are out of their mind. I'm not the only one that thinks these people are capable of evil doctrine. Their own person, Epimedes, said that they were crazy. Their own philosopher said that they were lazy and that they were evil. So, Titus, you got to be careful in selecting these pastors for the church because in Titus, they're going to have a really hard job. So, you see a reliable source, but secondly, you see that there has to be a ready sword when it comes to deterioration. Right? Look at verses 13 through 14. Paul affirms that by saying, This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. That is an imperative in the Greek, not a suggestion, but a command, right? To rebuke them sharply. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Paul is not saying rebuke them so that they're no longer a part of the church. Rebuke them so that they know what true teaching is. When we confront false teachers, we try to keep the bridge open without burning it so that they can teach sound doctrine. Don't cut them out of the faith. Just take them aside, tell them, and, but you have to show them from the Word of God, not your opinions or preferences. If you're going to confront false teaching, it has to come from God's Word, not, well, this is what I prefer. And I'm not talking about the gray areas of Scripture. We all know there's gray areas. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the main doctrinal things. Like if somebody were to come in and say, I don't believe in the Trinity right? That's a main doctrinal issue. I don't believe in the deity of Jesus. Okay, that's a main doctrinal issue. I don't believe that you, I I believe you have to work for your salvation. That is a main doctrinal issue. And one thing that we do at our church now is we have a new members class. And I try to make sure doctrinally that everybody lines up and I ask questions based on doctrine to make sure that you know what we believe and that you believe that too. Now, Paul does not mince his words here. Look at what he says to rebuke them sharply. We've already studied this Greek word, and we'll study it again tonight at the ordination service. But it's the word elencho, and it literally means to put to proof, to test, convict, and refute. Now, the task that Titus was given at Crete was not easy, but Paul wants him to get that sword ready. And to get your sword ready, you've got to be ready spiritually. And you've got to know your word. That's one reason why the Bible reading plans are so important. You can't know the truth unless you're in the truth. Okay? All right, so we've seen that. Now, let's look at the fourth thing, defilement. If you look at verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. The Apostle Paul does something interesting to get his point across to young Titus. Paul is contrasting two social classes of people in order to highlight the problems of the troublemakers. There are those that are pure, which represent believers, and those that are not pure, which are the unbelieving. It seems here that Paul's remembering what Jesus said, and if you're taking notes, write this down, what Jesus said in Luke 11, verses 37 through 41. Luke 11, 37 through 41, when he was invited to dine with the Pharisees, and Jesus did not wash his hands. You remember that? Now, for those of you that don't like to wash your hands, please don't say, well, Jesus didn't wash his hands. That's... Not an excuse for you to do that, right? But in that passage in Luke 11, verses 37 through 41, Jesus explained that the Pharisees were washing outside, but on the inside they were full of greed and wickedness. You can clean out the outside all day long. Those false teachers look so good. Those false teachers are so attractive, not just in their appearance, but in what they say. And it's important that you know that the inside matters too. And so Paul is contrasting this defilement here. John MacArthur said, when a person is pure in heart and mind, his perspective on all things are pure, and that inner purity always produces outer purity. Now, the circumcision party, they were defiling, these Judaizers were defiling themselves and the local church at Crete by making folks think that a person can receive God's reconciliation by their own power, their own works, instead of accepting what God has done. Now, the Jerusalem Council of Acts 15 
was supposed, and it did, address these issues. And I told you that it is believed that Titus was brought to the Jerusalem council for, council for Paul to prove his point. When Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 10.3, he was clear. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Here's the thing. False teachers have defiled themselves. They've made themselves impure. They've brought their own impurity in. Nobody's done it to them. They've done it to themselves. They have the choice. Just one thing to show you here. False teachers make their own decision. False teachers choose to go astray. And if you're not saved, you're choosing to live a life apart from God. Twice in verse 15, we see the English word defiled. And it comes from the Greek word minio, right? And it only occurs five times in the New Testament. And it literally means to tinge, dye, stain, pollute, and defile. It occurs twice in this verse. Once in John 18, 28. Once in Hebrews 12, 15. And once in Jude 8. Just as one chooses to accept Christ, one chooses to be a false teacher. One chooses to go against the grain. The point, Paul, the point Paul is making is that the perspectives and actions of these Judaizers is infected with their own defilement, which is sin. And there are people here this morning that are infected with your own defilement. You're infected by sin. You have not asked Jesus to take your defilement out of you and ask him to save you. And if you are not a Christian, by definition, you are a false teacher which means you are believing things that are not the truth of the gospel, right? So an atheist is a false teacher, right? And all those different religions that don't believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. As we know what Jesus said in John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So pastors are to be like physicians, to help diagnose and help a person get sin out of their life so that they can be a vessel for God to use. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 11? It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. This defiles a person. I was reading this week and heard a podcast. It was very interesting where this pastor was talking about the epidemic that we have in our Southern Baptist Convention of pastors leaving the ministry at a higher rate than they're coming into the ministry. You know that. It's very well known that that's going on. It's a huge problem. And so what he said was one of the problems is that churches don't treat pastors like they would their doctor or like they would their mechanic. Here's the thing. Your mechanic goes to school, learns a trade, learns all about cars. If your mechanic comes to you and tells you that you need new tires, you would be very dumb to not go get new tires. You'd be putting yourself in danger. If you go into a hospital room uh, or at, the, uh, at a doctor's office and the doctor says, hey, you've got some blockages, you need to have this surgery in order to be able to survive. If you choose not to do that, you're risking your own early departure from this life. Amen. But when a pastor comes to you and shows you from the Word of God, a pastor who's probably been to school, a pastor who's been pastoring for several years or whatever the case may be, and shows you from the Word of God and diagnoses you spiritually, I'm not listening to you. We'll listen to the doctor, we'll listen to the mechanic... Why don't we listen to the expositor? We'll go on Facebook and tell all our friends not to go to that church because of what the expositor said to us that offended us. We'll make rumors about their wives and their kids and their families. We'll leave the church and put nasty things out there because we don't want to listen to the diagnosis. Here's the diagnosis I have for you. You're a sinner and you need a Savior. And when we call sin out, that is a diagnosis by the spiritual physician. Obviously, Christ is the one who comes in and does the surgery. But my job is to tell you what the problem is. It amazes me how many of us listen to doctors, but we don't listen to preachers. We listen to mechanics. I listen to whatever my father-in-law tells me about my truck. He says it needs something. Okay, you take it this week. Mike will bring it to you or whatever. Just kidding, Mike. Not really. Whatever needs to be done, right? We go ahead and do it. Mike went a few months ago with my truck, and the guy at the tire store said he needs a new tire, and we got a new tire. 
You need to get this sin out of your life. It's wrong. Oh, I hate you, preacher. <laughs> Happens all the time. The other thing that we see in false teachers, lastly and finally, in verse 16, is disobedience. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. At the end of the day, false teachers are not fit for the ministry because they don't believe in the ministry of Jesus. And if somebody doesn't believe in Jesus, they're not fit to teach. In verse 16, I believe the Apostle Paul is warning Titus and us to not allow such men to serve in the pulpit. Now, here's something I want to say about this. I know our church is growing at a rapid rate. But I would rather our church have sound, theological, doctrinally sound teachers than to have people that are not yet ready to teach. It does take time. In other words, don't get offended if you've been here three months and you haven't been asked to teach a Sunday school class. We have to get to know you. You have to get to know us. Right? I mean, there's, there's a, a trust there when teaching the Word of God. And like James said in chapter 3, verse 1, for those that teach, you better watch out. Those that teach the Word of God, you will be held to a higher standard, Sunday school teachers. You will be held to a higher standard, deacons. Right? We're going to be held to a higher standard, whether that be in pulpits, on TV screens, social media, or YouTube. Everything that you are taught from a preacher should come from the Bible. Everything that you're taught, that preacher should be able to take it out and show you in Scripture. In order for us to be able to lovingly confront false teachers, we actually have to know the truth. Let me show you two things, and I'll close. When it comes to disobedience, false teachers are disconnected. There's a huge disconnection there. Look at verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. If you know Jesus, your life will reflect Him. Let me say that again. If you know Jesus, your life will reflect Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we're saved by good works. But if you are saved, nobody will have to beg you to work for God. If we are saved, there should be fruit that should be evident in your life. If you are saved, people should know it. People should be able to tell. I mean, the God of the universe, if you're a Christian, the God of the universe lives inside you, so everybody should be able to know that. Everybody should be able to see that. There's a disconnection between false teachers. They say one thing and they do another. Obviously, disobedience of any kind shows that there's a disconnection between receiving the truth and reciprocating the truth. Robert Yarborough said there's a disconnect between their confession and their behavior. I truly believe that if somebody's a Christian, you're going to know it by the actions that they live by the fruit on their tree. Confessions mean nothing if there's not a change. How can you and I, or what you and I, how you and I speak are going to reveal what we really believe and think? Confessions mean nothing if they're not a change. There's a disconnection. Secondly, there's a demotion. Those that are false teachers need to be demoted. Paul says they need to be silenced and they need to be removed. It's almost like they need to have a rope around their leg and when they teach a false doctrine, you jerk it out and they're out, right? That needs to be done. That doesn't mean they're out of the church, but they're out of teaching for a season in order to have correction. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work is what verse 16 says. Those who are consistently and constantly disobedient to God's word in teaching and living should be demoted. Now, let me say this too. Sunday school teachers, church leaders, singers, anybody who leads in the church, your life should reflect the gospel. That does not mean you're perfect. None of us are. But that does mean that we need to walk it like we talk it. It doesn't matter where you serve in the church. If there is an unrepentant sin there, you don't need to be serving. An unrepentant sin. Something that you don't think is wrong and you're just going to do it because you want to do it. Right? That needs to be taken care of between you and the Father. I believe if false teachers are not repentant and willing to obey the Lord, they will and should be removed. Here's what Jeremiah said in chapter 23, verse 32. Jeremiah 23, 32 about those who were lying against God. 
He said, Behold, I am against those who prophesy lying dreams, declares the Lord, and who tell them and lead my people astray by their lies and their recklessness, when I did not send them or charge them. So they do not profit this people at all, declares the Lord. Now, as we close this morning, I don't want you to leave and say, Well, that's another boring message that doesn't apply to me. Because that's not true. If you're a Christian... You need to be aware of false teaching. You need to know what is truth. You need to know what is not. When in reality, this recurs to all of us. One reason that our doctrine in Southern Baptist churches has greatly deteriorated is because we don't know false teachers when we see them. One reason that Hannah and I go to the Southern Baptist Convention every year that you send us to the convention, the one reason that I'm on the Administrative Business Council for the Lexington Association and I'm on all these kind of things is so that I can keep up doctrinally what's going on in our convention, what's going on in our association so that I can keep them accountable and they can keep our church accountable so that we don't have a doctrinal drift because the world that we're living in now, they want us to drift so hard they don't want us to offend anybody they don't want us to say that the LGBTQW X Y and Z is wrong they don't want us to say that but it is they don't want us to say that adultery is wrong but it is they don't want us to say that pornography is wrong but it is they don't want us to talk about politics and and they don't care about the evangelicals and the and the Christians and the believers in Christ they don't want you to care about those things because they want you to conform to the cultural drift that is all the way over here and if you don't know the truth, the truth, you will ride that surfboard like crazy. And if you don't have a preacher, when you get on that surfboard that tells you to get off, you need to get you a new one. Because you've got to confront those things. Confront them in your own life, but confront them when you see them. This church has been silenced on Facebook by some of our sermons. You can't hear some of our sermons on Facebook because they've been silenced. Okay, Facebook world, silence us again. Because we won't stop. But as a church, we have to be committed to confrontation. Confrontation of false teachers when we see their defiance, their deception, their deterioration, their defilement, and their disobedience. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity we've had this morning to look at your word in Titus chapter 1. And, and Father, I pray, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you keep me clean and you keep me close through my ministry, that I will never doctrinally drift away from what I believe in you. Sadly, Father, over the years, so many preachers have drifted doctrinally to where they're not even in the ministry anymore. They're not even in church anymore. And God, I just pray, Father, that during this service, that our church, although this probably isn't a message to make you want to go out and stomp your feet and shout, or well, does me, but, but Lord, that we would be committed to confronting false doctrine when it comes to our doorstep. So that we are not like the many churches that close every year because somewhere along the line 30 years ago, they slipped up. Somewhere along the line, they... They slid on a doctrine because they were afraid of a family leaving. Or they were afraid of losing some tithes and offerings. God, I know that if we stick by the book that you're going to take care of us. So God, we're going to stick with it. And we're going to confront false teaching. And we're going to be committed to confronting those things as much as we have to. Because we know, Father, that you're the head of this church. And we're not worried about what anybody else says on the outside. We're worried about what you said in the inside of the pages of the book. We pray all this in Jesus' name. All God's people say, if you would. This is Pastor Brady, and thank you for tuning in to today's live worship service here from First Baptist Church of Gaston. Maybe today you feel the Lord tugging on your heart after that message and after our worship service. If you would, please email or call the number below or email the email address and you can contact us if you made a decision 
Maybe you want to talk with me about accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody about rededicating your life. Or just maybe you want more information about The Caring Place. You want more information about our church and the different ministries that we offer. Whatever the case may be, I want to invite you to respond. I want to thank you for watching, whether it's on Facebook, maybe it's on YouTube, or even our website. No matter where you're watching, we thank you for tuning in. We hope to see you next time. And don't forget, we love you here at The Caring Place. It gathers, grows, and goes all to the glory of God.